Hello, this is the 1904 Club with me, Barry Cooper, the Hall City podcast from the Hall Daily Mail. Today I'm joined, as ever, by David Prutton. Prut, were you down at Wembley yesterday? I was, I was. I was at Norwich on Saturday, then I was at Wembley yesterday. And how was how was your weekend then? Disappointing Good. on Saturday for all of us, I think, in terms of Norwich. Yes, it, yeah, Ipswich, not at it, it at all, unfortunately. Um and not re- not no real jeopardy in the game for Norwich from what I, from what I saw. Um, chatting to a few of their lads afterwards, who were they were a thoroughly nice bunch. Um, they they were very happy with the victory. Um, the, the the big kind of show of um, celebration at the end with the arms going, and we all thought was a little bit premature. Even though I understand because you beat your fist rivals, it's a big thing, and they've not beaten them. In, uh, they've not which haven't been Norwich in fifteen years, which is uh, ridiculous, really. But. Um, but yeah, they uh, they um, had a very good day, obviously, which then cast a little bit of a shadow on the rest of the day, particularly on this podcast. But Hull City back to winning ways and a wonderful performance to boot, which we can talk very, very healthily about shortly. Fletch, you were down in Cardiff with me. Um, the Welsh cakes were a welcome bonus, particularly after that <laughs> depressing offer of, of, of a... I don't even know what, it, what pie it was, but it was bad. Um, it's a how, bad how, how, pie. How was, yeah, it was not a patch on what we get at Hall City. It was it was chicken and mushroom, and it looked like it, oh, it was bleak. I, I couldn't eat it in the end. Um, Fletch, good weekend? Yes, splendid weekend, like you. We was watching Norwich together, wasn't we? And um, we'd become Ipswich fans for a very brief time, <laughs> shouting at the telly, and everyone's looking at us going, what are you getting? What's the matter? <laughs> what are you doing? Um, but then the game itself, three points in the bag, and... I feel like any sort of negativity going into the game was immediately cast aside. And now we seem to be in a really bubbly position going into this week with a game on Wednesday. So, yeah, very good. Uh, and Burnsy, you, you were probably out and about at the weekend, I should think, doing your thing. I was. I was. Um, and it's a, it's amazing a, what a difference a win makes after two losses at Easter. They've, they've given themselves a little bit of hope. And I'm I'm glad Prutz was at Norwich and saw him firsthand because he can tell us whether there's any chinks in their armour because uh, it's theirs to lose, Norwich, really. Mm-hmm. And, um, you know, can, can City now probably win five of the last six games? They're all six games. Uh, to make it, but it, it it feels a little better having seen them win and score some goals, score three goals, which is good. But then you've that's away, got to come back to home mm. for the next two games. Norwich, interestingly, are away their next two games, and that might be the chink in the armour because I think chaps, their away form is a bit dodgy, isn't it? Brooks is nodding there. Yeah, yeah, they've won the last eight at home. So that goes mm. to show that disparity between themselves um at Carrow Road and on the road. So that yeah, I think you're right, Burns. That could that could um buy into it obviously, and, and as we'll come to discuss, a slight reversal of what City have managed to kind of conjure up at the MKM this season. On the subject of, of Saturday, as we I think we all said before the game it was must win. Liam himself said it was must win. So that and I think there was certainly pressure going into it. And given Norwich's result before the game, with goal difference, effectively increased that gap to 10 points, didn't it? So mm. it was, you know, it, it would have been pretty much season over if they'd not have won. And and in fairness, they they it, it never looked in any danger, even when you had that moment when Carl and Grant scored, you know, early in the second half to, to get Cardiff back in it. City responded so well, as we saw it not too long ago at Huddersfield. And they went up the other end and killed it off and, and if there was one criticism, it wasn't four or five in the end. I mean, poor old Mika Seri, when, when Jaden does brilliantly to win the ball in, in stoppage time, he races clear and you're thinking, I'd already written goal. I, th- I was so convinced he was going to rattle in the net. And even with Seri, who'd lung- burst his lungs to get up with him and had got a tap in, Jaden put it wide and you, they, they, they should have won by more. But it, it was, it, I think it was, I said to Liam afterwards, it was, it just calms everybody down a bit. It, it You know, it's three points. They needed a victory, uh, and they got it, and they got they got a performance to match. What go on, Bernsey? What was different, fellas, about the performance, Fletch? What what was different? I think well, the first oh, twenty away from, home, away from home for starters, which as we've seen all season, that make that for whatever reason, and nobody can quite put the finger on it, that does make a massive difference. Well, I think um, Cardiff sat in, which. Caught me by surprise at first, but then when you look at the data and you look at how they've set up against teams in the top half, they've given those teams the respect of knowing that maybe their best way and course of action is to go and counter. But 
What was different this time is I think Hull City sussed out quickly how to get through the defence through the middle, not just out wide. You know, the second goal is an absolute piece of art. Yeah, from back to, from back to front, it's absolutely superb. But the the final pass is a significant through ball to completely open the door for Carvalho, who makes a fantastic run. Um, other other players, Amur, Amur, you, you were saying earlier, Baz, about how it could have been more. Amur could have had a brace, he hit the post twice, one off the keeper and one off his own shot. He was and a joy then, to watch, Flash. He was brilliant. He, he, he yeah. was actually my man of the match. Yeah, I had him down as... I know that's... Maybe people are going, what? As if... Because Carvalho scored twice. But I actually thought Amur did more off the ball than Carvalho did, given different positions. But yeah, um, Cardiff, in summary, a little bit taken aback at first that they were so negative in front of their own supporters. But then Hull City found a way through, which is really pleasing, which is maybe something they haven't done as often as they should. That second goal. Well, that was... Carvalho. Sorry, Buzz. I was going to say that Carvalho goal. Is he signing it and hanging it in the ferrets then? If it's a word <laughs> I, don't, I don't know what Fabio's connection with the ferrets is. To be honest, <laughs> I'm sure. I'm sure if he asked, it'd be different, wouldn't it? It would be different. Yeah. That was that, that was Liam Rossini's style of play um, personified and perfected. Starting with the goalkeeper, a couple of passes, you know, into midfield, back out, back wide. And then the 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 the, the, um, the dummy from Carvalho that into you know emerged touch into two fans two fans weighted ball and what I loved from Carvalho was just he didn't snatch at it did he? it was that he had the presence of mind the confidence and the awareness just to let it, to let it roll to roll onto it and then mm. stroke it past Horvath it was it was a work of art it was the goal was was sublime and I'm I'm sure I saw a stat afterwards that that was two fans first assist yeah which seems yeah, it was ridiculous really um, he's been the assister of assists but not the actual assist man <laughs> could put it that way Prutz from your point That's of view we come in soon yeah, I'll, I'll, don't worry there's, there's such statistical yeah. analysis in football these days they will be coming hmm. Prutz from your point of view we as, as I said before we spoke a lot in the build up to the game about the pressure uh, hmm. football related pressure of course you know it's not quite trying to feed your kids or or pay the bills, yeah. not that. Yeah. Relative, relative, yeah. Um, the need to go there and win, which was only you know exemplified given the game that you watched down at Carrow Road. What was your assessment of, of of the of the result and the performance coming in? Well, I think uh, the the managing to get my hand on some extended highlights. Um, th there was again, it, it's what we discussed last week, and it's what will be the main frustration if you're a City fan that sits in the MKM. And then goes on the road to watch them. There was an energy, there was an, a real um, <clears throat> dynamism, I thought, to the way that City went about winning the ball back when they lost it. You mentioned those passes forward. How often have we seen them get in and around the box at home and kind of go, no, check out, go again, go again, go again. I understand, and we understand there's a, an element of patience done for it, but um, Louis Coyle a couple of times looking for that pass in behind their opposite fullback, taking risks with the ball, which is exactly what football in the final third should look like. It's great to dominate the ball. Brought, so, Louis, Louis didn't play on Saturday. Hang on, who, who, who's, who's played? Who's... So got the what, who's, can I just check, what extended highlights have you been watching? Well, well, I, well I was watching... watching this, the home this, game? <laughs> no, this is... That's, that's, well, there's, who is it then who looks exactly like Louis down the right-hand side? A member of the club's media staff, Bartholomew, he was getting he was getting confused for, for Louis Coyle in, in Weatherspoons on uh, Friday night. There was, there was gen genuinely, before the first goal went in, there's a ball played, almost like a defence splitting pass down the right-hand side. And I thought, Ricky that's Slater. Really There you go. Jesus. I, I mean, I don't know who, who was more offended at looking like the other. I think probably, I don't know, given how many facial batterings Louis Coyle's taken, probably Regan, because he, <laughs> he hasn't. Um, but so, but the, the roundabout, the, the, the point I was making with no forensic detail whatsoever. So when Dean Windass got on the ball on the right-hand side, right, and he saw Andy Payton. <laughs> he Great tackle Andy by Payton, Ashton, by the way, late on. Made that, made that run after Ian Hesford had thrown the ball out from the back. <laughs> <laughs> really 12 hours. Um, High-quality <laughs> podcasting, folks. <laughs> so anyway, Nottingham Forest, right? I mean, what, the way they start their game... Um, was was, yeah, yeah, get, right. We're trying to justify this point that I was making, which is I've completely made null and void by getting players mixed up. Um, <laughs> there, there was, there just seemed to be more directness. Now, sometimes the word direct in football is seen as a, as a stick to batter teams with and seen as a bit of a dirty word, but it's not when it, when it works like it does against Cardiff, 
is it? And it you get a team that, as you quite rightly say, Baz, scored three, could have been five, maybe even six. Um, a real composure from Fabio in two occasions, great, great volley. And then I know what you mean about the way he's moved his feet, the way he's let the ball run across him. So it becomes, so in, in, a, in a very subtle and uh, ingenious way, makes it a straightforward chance of a player of his ability, doesn't it? He moves his body, so it's now a pass into the back of the net. And then Jaden looking as dangerous as he has done for a long time, uh, getting forward and, and, and finishing him off. So there, there was so much to like about it. And almost, it wasn't predictable in the way that it was coming after a poor Easter weekend, but it was set up for them to go there and do that, wasn't it? Like I said, the frustration comes from Cat, they set up to do that at home because of the way that Liam wants to dominate the game or the way that he feels the game should go uh, when they're on the home turf. I don't quite know that, but they needed to win. They saw the Norwich um, result. And again, a team that they are now trying to catch, plus throwing to it Coventry beating Leeds. It's, yeah. um, it, it's, it was a must win. It became a have one. And then you move on again to, to the midweek game. So pressure's unrelenting and relative, as you say, but... It's it's them doing potentially burns, isn't it? The the job that we assume them to do, given the players that they've got. Exactly, exactly. That's you know we know they're capable of that standard. Mm. The, the 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 problem is, you look at the home form; they've they've not hit that standard anywhere near enough. And and then you you come to Middlesbrough, who've unbeaten in seven, I think, five wins in that, five clean sheets, top of the form table in the division. Um, I'm, I'm giving you the dose of reality now, fellas. Top of the form <laughs> division, uh, the form table in the division in the last six games. Just on Carvalho, because people send, send us questions all the time, and we probably didn't get through enough last week. My fault, because the, you know, I should have got into them. Chris Mumby says, um, "What's the chance of Carvalho uh, re-signing next year? He's got seven in fourteen now. He was." Um, for me, he was underachieving earlier. I was just thinking, well, well, what's here? But we're, we're definitely seeing it now. Um, my view is that they only really get him if if they go up, and I'm not convinced they're going to go up. Baz? Just before you go, I answer that. I wanted to go back to the point that Prutz um, made about Louis Coyle, or, or as it was, Regan Slater playing the board. Um, <laughs> Regan Coyle. Regan Coyle, yeah. There was, <laughs> there was one early on, Regan played a lovely ball um, for Omer and I thought to start with, actually, City looked, they, they struggled to break the line. And then Omer was the one that did that. And it was a pass from, from Slater inside right. And he ran onto it and he, he forced a good save from um, from Ethan Horvath. And then mm. for, the, for the goal, the first goal, which Carvalho, it was brilliant. It, it came from Omer um, running back to win the, he, he won the ball off a Cardiff player, turned, came towards, came into the box hit the post via Horvath, he, he, he got down and tipped onto the post. And then obviously from the, that corner, um, and that was, as you, as you touched on there, the ball in behind, trying to break that line and, and get Omer, Omer running on. And it was it, it was a tactic they used really well in the first half. And as I say, that moment when Omer ran back, tackled the, tackled the player, won the ball off him, went the other way towards the box, got the shot away, hit the post. You know, that kind of typified his performance Throughout, so he was excellent, um, and he deserved a goal with his his, his lovely cur curving effort second half. Mm. Um, on the subject of Carvalho Burnsy, I think I had a really good chat with him after the game actually, uh, and he he was very positive about Liam. Uh, you know, Liam said Liam said had said, had said to me before, I, I really hope I've loved working with him. I really hoped I've improved him as a player. Uh, Fabio said, Yeah, he, he he has. He's improved under Liam um, in terms of getting him back. Yeah, I think realistically, if they get promoted, then they've got a chance. If if they don't get promoted, I would say there's no chance. It, but it is football; you never know. We all we've we've all seen firsthand just how persuasive Ajun can be, um, coupled with with Tan and um, and Liam as well. You never know. It depends. I think a lot of it depends on what happens at Liverpool in the summer. Obviously, we know that. I think I've heard somewhere that the manager, their manager, might leave. I can't <laughs> uh, what happens Get there? Quiet. Yeah, they have, haven't they? I've, I've, but yeah, so what, what happens at Liverpool? Uh, who comes in for him? Premier League, you know. Ultimately, for Fabio, you know, he's played himself back into the shop window. He's played him, and more importantly than that, he's 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 proved to himself that he can do it. 
uh, and you scored goals regularly, you know, three goals in two games now for Fabio, and I wouldn't bet b- b- against him scoring against Borough. Um, so, yeah, I mean, we'll have to wait and see what happens in the summer. It's going to be a, a big summer, isn't it? And we'll talk a lot about that in the coming weeks. It will be a huge summer, irrespective of what division they're in. Uh, there's going to be a, an awful lot of change again. And, and Fabio, you'd imagine, will probably move on to to, uh, to the Premier and play in the Premier League because that's that's where he sees himself. Um, Prots? It's um, it's a funny one, isn't it? Because we, we again we we discussed what were the stats, Burns? He's seven in fourteen. 14. This morning he's got seven in fourteen, I think. Which actually doesn't. I mean, that's, yeah, yeah it, um, we, it, it's good. And but we have spoken to him, spoken about him uh, in the sense of maybe disappointed has not been the right word, but the the size of the impact that I think we thought we he might have on this city side and the championship as a whole and. We've mentioned several other players in that when it came to recruitment. But 17-14, that's a decent return. So that goes to show you've got a player who is enjoying his football, who Liam is getting something positive out of. It absolutely does depend on where they find themselves next season. Um, Because with the greatest respect to what City are and what City offer, a player that's gone from Fulham to Liverpool, uh, who's been on the continent and then finds himself in a team that might not get in the top six in the championship, to me, being a very cynical. That's not his ideal career trajectory, is it? I'm not saying that that, that it's it's disrespecting of where City find themselves, but if and with the youth on the side of the player, he's got to be looking at at least a, a Premier League club to be his next port of call. I think whether whether we've seen that with our own eyes remains to be seen. But sometimes players in different teams you get a different tune out of. Um, but it, it does seem broadly positive, doesn't it? But again, I, I hope it doesn't fall into that thing where. You, we mentioned it about Liam Delap as well, and we'll talk about Liam very shortly. Um, Hull City being a nice place to develop players. Because if you're a City fan, you're going, well, that's brilliant that you're all developing, but can we do something? Can we get promoted? Can we at least get in the... Can we be in the shake-up? You don't want to be just that team that becomes a stepping stone for players to kind of bounce through and bounce out, bounce through and bounce out, for managers to bounce through and bounce out. Do you? That Hull City fans deserve more than that. The club deserves more than that. And if... The current um, regime is 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 anything like the way it's talking and the way it's shown. That's exactly what Ajahn wants, doesn't he? he? He he doesn't want to be the stepping stone football club. He wants Hull City to be a destination football club for very good players who are coming into their peak. So yeah, th- it, there's a debate there for for potentially the end of the season and where City end up. But like I said, make make it a welcoming place, make it a hospitable place, but not too nice. Not too nice that people go, I'll go there for a bit. Not much pressure at City. I'll just kind of flirt with the top six and then move on. It's got to be a place that really engineers ambition, belief and results, basically. Really good point. Go on, Flatch, because we 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 talked on Saturday a lot about Carvalho before the game and you know how how important he was um to this team and, and how he how important it would be going forward. Yeah, and I think it's now starting to blossom, isn't it? We we, we... I think the majority of us in it here and people online were very sceptical that it was being a bit of a slow starter. And I I raised the point that, you know, he needed some time and thankfully it's come true. I think it's going to be more difficult for him to get in Liverpool's team next year to touch upon what Prutz was discussing, what you was discussing, Baz, because look at the front line that's in front of him that he's got to try and get into. I think Morton's passage is probably simpler. So I could see, but it's, it's interesting, isn't it? Because if they do get in the playoffs and they're a whisker away, if they get to Wembley, um, then that might be more of an encouragement for some players of their magnitude to, to come in next year. Um, because I can see the relationships from our side look very, very positive. So I think that's one thing. If they don't go up this year, you've still got those foundations. I totally get what Prutz is saying about we don't want to be a stepping stone club. That's completely true. I think some perspective is that look how far the club have had to come in the last two or three seasons from, you know, getting themselves out of League One at the first attempt when we've seen so many clubs really struggle to get out of that division, your Sunderland's, your Sheffield Wednesdays in particular. I think it's been quite a meteoric rise and they're in a good position where, of course, we want to... I I mean, I do anyway. I want to go up this season. I want to be in the Premier League next year. But if they do stay down, players like Carvalho's ability, I think, can still be enticed even if they don't make the playoff places. And I think that's... Burns, I'll come to you next. I think that's a, a point that's worth worth making actually because I, I I kind of get this feeling and you know we're we're in the bubble a bit as well um being around the team and traveling with the team and like 
you know, going going to every single game up and down the country, you kind of get into a bubble a bit. Um, that actually, it's win or it's it's promotion or bust, and actually, it, the world the world will end on May the fourth if City finish seventh. You know, it, it won't, and the, the, they've the, they've put the building blocks in place this season. They've gone. Prob- have they overachieved? I know Benji. We've spoken a lot about that with the players they've signed in January. Uh, I don't think it's a disaster if they don't go up, and I think they. As a football club, they will be stronger for this experience. I think the group that remain that will remain after all the lone players go back will be stronger for the experience if they don't go up. Um, so I don't think it's you know I don't think we sit there on May the fifth going oh, that's a bloody disaster you know that's all that's the end of it. It's um, you know you know we want to they want to go up this year and you know they're still in with a shout. It's they're an outside bet. I think it's I think you have to say that. You know, Perhaps I saw a, a graphic on Sky before after the Norwich game before we kicked off at Cardiff that said that gave City a two percent chance of making the playoffs. Preston with three. Um, that's you know, up to making those up. That's not Sky. That's us using. How is it, yeah. how is it calculated for it to be two yeah, percent? God knows. If, if they don't, what I'm saying is my point being if if, if they don't make the top six um, and they, they are going to need you know in, <clears throat> incredible form to, to to achieve that just to overthrow Norwich. Um, it isn't the end of the world, and I think that is the point. I know if you look at social media after a defeat or mm. what have you, it's the it is the end of the world. The world is going to end if, if City don't get promoted or don't even finish in the top six. So that was that, that was the point I wanted to make on the back of your there's, flag, Re there, there, There's um there was I can't remember whether it was in the NBA or the NFL where there were there was a, a press conference and there was a question asked of a player about success and failure and about failing uh, in a season. And then he kind of stopped him and he very kind of eloquently described what his definition of failure was and what his definition of success was and tried to explain it to the and, and to have it in such kind of kind of linear terms of you're either one or the other. You're absolutely right, Baz, because that that can really dismiss a lot of hard work, a lot of good work, a lot of foundational work that's been put in. Because if you look at we, we, we talk about this in the sense of being disappointed if City don't make it because they've been in the top six. That's why. If they've been 10th all season, expectation levels are different. But very naturally, with football and football fans, this is exactly what it is. If you look at the top of the table, down to where Hull City find themselves in the Championship, Leicester at the top, Ipswich lead, Southampton, West Brom, Norwich, Coventry, Borough, Hull. Leicester leads and Southampton, former Premier League teams. Ipswich have been on fire. West Brom have got better steadily under Carlos Corberan. Norwich City got better steadily under David Wagner. Coventry were in the playoff final last season. Borough were in the playoffs last season. And then you find Hull City. So, in theory, given historically what's happened over the last couple of seasons, Hull City being in ninth in the Championship is a perfectly respectable situation. Perfectly respectable situation. But because they've been in the top six, that changes the perception of what they are and what they should be come the end of the season. So it's you, you're absolutely right to preach that, not preach, to, to promote that sense of patience and time, a bit like Fletcher's point. But because football's so immediate, that's why it's got to be judged. I say got to be an in inverted commas, it, whether it's success, success or failure, whether the recruitment's been good, whether the manager's been the right manager because of where they've been during the course of a season. But in, in my mind, from what I've seen, watching and, and having the, the privilege of covering the games, there are at least six better teams than Hull City in this division. Therefore, that's your top six. So if Hull City get into the top six, they've done a wonderful job. And I think the frustration, Burnsley, coming to you now next, um, I think the frustration of, of, of a lot of us, of fans, you know, media, and, and also within the football club as well, is that they have... Um, they played so well at times this season. You know, you, you, there's, there's eye-catching performances throughout the campaign, but we, we we will always come back to certain performance or certain certain results specifically, particularly at home. And I think that's that. You know, I've written I've written a column for for this afternoon actually that says, you know, the post mortem of where they've dropped points here, there, and everywhere can probably wait because they've still got a chance. When the season's mm-hmm. finished, then we can go. Well, that result at home in in September, that result at home in October, November, blah blah. Is, is where that's cost them. I think the frustration of, of, of City missing out, if they if they were to miss out, comes from a place of 
We know they're a good side. And when they turn it on and when they play well, a la Leicester, a la Southampton, even Cardiff on Saturday, um, they have got, um, you know, that goal, the, the second goal at Cardiff is, is, is the prime example of what, when it, when it clicks, it's, it's beautiful mm. to watch and it's effective when there's an end product at the end of it. Um, but that is, you know, that, that, I think that is the frustration. But as you say, Prost, when you look at the table, for them to be in ninth, they've made incredible progress from where they were la- last season alone. Um, and I think you made a point, a really good point last week on, on last week's pod about the players they signed. Yes, we've, we've all bigged them up, but Philogene came from Cardiff in a relegation battle, wasn't wanted mm. by Villa. You know, Carvalho had been out. Yeah, he's probably the one standout, but he'd been out in, at RB Leipzig, not playing. You mm. know, Tyler Morton had been on loan at Blackburn. Zaruri promoted with uh, with Burnley, but nobody knew him before that. And it's, so it's, you know, we've they've signed some good players, Giles, um, you know, did well at, at Borough, but went to Luton hasn't featured. Um, mm. So they've they've signed big names in Championship terms, but players that we we've probably bigged up because of their name and their immediate success. Burnsy, I know I've been coming to you for the last twenty five minutes, so and you've been scowling. So go for it. Don't don't worry, it's wind. Don't, it's, I'm not scowling. It's, it's wind. Uh, just it's I, I've just I, I've just found it frustrating. I absolutely take what Prox is saying, and I would have said. Top 10 finish this season um, was reasonable, but they've raised expectation. Let's not forget um, they're, they're losing, you know, the, the, or Rajan's funding the club to, you know, an additional 400 grand a week. They have signed all these players. Uh, the talk has always been of, of making the playoffs. That was the aim and, and what they wanted to do. And they were in a good position to do it. And, you know, I, I accept they've got a chance to come back to Norwich's away form has maybe been the key to this because they're not very good away and the next two games are away. But I do feel, personally, they've, they've underachieved and I've found them so frustrating watching them at home. And, you know, to me, that home form should have been sorted out. And it, and it hasn't been. And I go back to my point, if they finish outside the top 10, say they finish 12th, to, to, to me, yes, there's well, progress on last season. Sorry? I don't. Well, they, well, I, can't, I, can't, I can't see. Well, they probably like won't. Well, what? But but the point I was making last week after two defeats at Easter, if they finish twelfth, to me, to me, that is an underachieving season. They they've achieved, but they've not achieved enough mm. in in terms of the the hype and the talk and the players they've signed. They've not achieved enough for me. They've they've still got a chance to do it, but the the home form has just let them down terribly, and they've they've not sorted about. For me, that's the harsh reality of. I was it talking is. harsh reality because I'm a miserable so and so. No, yeah, you're absolutely right. The home form is hasn't been good enough. I mean, they're down in 14th place when it comes to the home form. On the flip side, away from home, they you know that was their tenth away win of the season on Saturday. They've, I think they're fifth in the away table, uh, but that we can't get away from the fact that their home form hasn't been good enough, and that is that's a fact. You know, Tan again reiterating that point. Tan did an interview with me out in Turkey a couple of weeks ago and said it must improve. And then Stoke Stoke happened. Uh, so okay. <laughs> let, but let's um, let's look at it. You've got Borough on on Wednesday night, who, as you said, Burns at the top are in great form. Uh, they're above City in the table. Obviously, they, they eased to victory over Swansea, which something City struggled with a few weeks ago. Um, they, they, they've they've done that. They're, they're one of the form teams in the league, um, and away from home, they're very good. I think they've had nine away wins. So you know, this is a. Obviously, a difficult game, but I kind of feel like this is this is a better game for City than Stoke or Birmingham or Plymouth or Millwall or the insert you know bottom end Championship team. I feel like the way that Middlesbrough play, that they will come and, and play, and, and that will lend itself to the way that City play. Prutz, what's your view on 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 first of all Borough, uh, but then QPR on Saturday? Two basically must win games, aren't they? Yeah, very much so. If 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 following on from what we said, the 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 kind of the ambition still lies in the playoffs, and they've got to beat them. But again, it's a, it's a borough side, as Burns is saying, with regards to the form, which is in very good form, and with a front four that can really cause problems. Finnazaz, I think, is a fantastic player. Sam Greenwood, Isaiah Jones, the pace that he's got down the right hand side, and Latte Lath leading the line. That they've got a team that's got those types of players. They've got. Um, consistency and experience in the middle of the pitch and they've got people that can change the game from the bench. So I think there's, there's a real there's a real um, tough test. And again, whether it's a case of Michael Carrick and his side rocking up and saying to City, go on then, beat us, 
that's where again this frustration comes in of do they just go after them in a kind of on the road type sense Hull City or do they then revert back to the Hull City at the MKM which is patience um an emphasis on possession and almost sometimes trying to create the perfect chance instead of looking for killer passes early doors um it be it then becoming a, a sense of of um a nutritional battle where either the fans are looking at the players to get them going or the players are looking at the fans saying come on he's like the gladiator one you're not entertained you know who comes first and it's a bit of that vicious circle and then you go to a QPR side that obviously take away the, the defeat at the weekend have been in wonderful form under Marty Sifuentes. He, he's gone in and transformed what looked like to be a properly desperate situation for QPR. So, so then again, there's another set of, a set of circumstances for City to um, to um, overcome. So if you want to finish in the top six, you've got to beat the teams around you, i.e. Borough. And if you've got aspirations of being one of the better if uh, sides in the Championship, you beat the teams down at the bottom. That's in simple terms, what the next two games are. And when you look at Norwich, as Burnsy said, they're, away, they're you know their home form is is in stark contrast to City, but their away form equally is in stark contrast to City. And mm. uh, you know Wednesday away, they'll be buoyed by the win at QPR in midweek. That the, I mean the bottom of the battle for relegation now Rotherham have, have gone is is fascinating, isn't it? But mm. they, Wednesday at Hillsborough, you know, is is not going to be an easy one for Norwich, uh, and then Preston away again. Another of the of the playoff team. So, and then I think their final away game is on the final day at Birmingham City. Who you know, given the state of Birmingham situation, yeah. they may need to win that to stay in the division. So, they are three tough away games for Norwich, aren't they? But ultimately, we can look at all these other results and fixtures. But City, you know, if City have got to win games and they've got to win the next two. Just a just a point, just so we are acknowledging the fact that people are. Sending us tweets to the 1904 club. James Godber says, uh, with Norwich's horrid away form, could see only five or six wins being enough as long as we win the game in hand against Coventry. Thanks for that, James. Talking to James's Fletch. Just to add some, maybe go a little deeper on Middlesbrough's form because we've spoken about how they've won nine games away from home. If you look at how their fixtures have actually and their results have been knitted together, it's almost a carbon copy, really, of City this year. So if you look against them away from home against the top half, City have actually been better. Borough have lost to Leeds, lost to West Brom, lost to Coventry, lost to Preston and lost to Bristol City. And it hasn't necessarily been games where either team has sat in and they've been counted on. They've been goal-crazy matches and Middlesbrough have leaked goals. So if it's two teams that are coming out against each other, this is going to benefit City, in my opinion, a whole lot better. But then Borough as well have maybe almost the same mentality at times when it comes to some opposition because they've lost at home to QPR they've lost at home to Stoke lost at home to Plymouth and lost at home to Millwall. The difference this time for me, and there hasn't been many occasions where it has happened for City is they've gone somewhere and won and played well but the team coming back to the MKM are actually managed by the same person so when we lost to Stoke it was a different team, Stephen Schumacher mm. who'd already done something significant with his Plymouth side, prevented the Tigers from winning Swansea were the same they had a different manager, Michael Duff had gone. So I don't think it's as cut and dry as saying, you know, Borough have won nine games and the decent way from home because they have got hiccups in them where they've let these big sides come in and actually hit a few goals past them, which if the Tigers do it, if they could, let's say, win this game by a 3-1 or a 3-2 where it's completely end-to-end, -end, then there's going to be that sort of post-mortem of actually they can do it at home and they can score goals and they can open up teams who might potentially sit in. Because that's kind of what Borough did last time when it was Michael Carrick's first game. They were so defensive and compact in the middle, City couldn't get through that time. But that was a long time ago. Mm. Defensively, and, and, and Carrick said this at the, from the start of the season, didn't he? They had they've had trouble defensively all season, um, and it's something they've never been able to to, to recover from. Pruss, I wanted to ask you um, tomorrow night. Sorry, Wednesday night, City Borough. It, it, both teams. A point is no good. I think. You know, Michael Carrick would say that. I know for a fact Liam would will, 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 will say that as well. Mm. A point achieves nothing for either side. Um, what? What? How does that change the dynamic of, of the game and, and the way that both managers will approach it and both teams will approach it, knowing that, you know, that, that is the danger. You can sometimes cancel, cancel each other out, but both teams need to go go for it because mm. you know, they, they need wins. They need, a, they need to win the game. A draw is no good. I suppose that's that's a really key question because, like you say, a, a point isn't great. Losing almost feels like 
the final nail potentially in a in any playoff coffin, doesn't it? Yeah. So that the real fine line between and there's me going back to how you how you deem games and how you judge games is either a success or a failure. Um so I, I don't think for one second it'll be a case of handbrake off going hell for leather, but there's got to be an element of we are well we're beyond now or never, aren't we? You've got this is we spoke about it after the disastrous weekend uh, for Easter. Any aspirations, any realistic ambitions of being in the top six? A defeat almost blows us apart. Um, a draw, a draw is another point in the right direction, but. But, but I mean, it, it's not nonsensical to say that three points is you, you're into kind of absolute must territory, isn't it? Really, I'd like to think that that does then make for an entertaining game if you are watching it as a neutral. But given the vested interest of what the two sets of fan bases will have, Borough obviously knowing all about getting into the playoffs as they did at the end of the last season, um, and this season being a bit more of a slow burner, and at, and at times, they, I mean, if if if, if you're deeming Hull City in ninth potentially finishing around there as a an, as an underachievement borough even though they lost key players of course a player that's got a bag full up top in in tuba and some very good loan signings um the the kind of general consensus would be them finishing out the ta- outside the top six is an underachievement as a club not necessarily as a plain right. staff but but as a club so um two teams not looking to salvage the seasons but to finish strongly given what they've shown. I'd like to think there's an element of going at it because, as I said, f- from seeing what I saw in the Cardiff game, barring getting players wrong, um, the the emphasis, the approach, the the all round like dynamism is the right word about the team was there to beat Cardiff, not to not lose to Cardiff, wasn't it? It was there to go. Well, we're coming here for three points, and anything less than that, but we're, we're not even kind of contemplated. They've got to do the same for the Borough game. If Opta are saying 2% chance, again, that was before City won at Cardiff. Um, how would you rate their chances looking at it now, Good six question. games ago, five for Norwich? Um, you know, Coventry in there as well, obviously a game in hand against City mm. and Bora and, and Preston. Where, where we sit now before I mean, a really, really important midweek round of games? Today, I mean, uh, like I said, it, it, I don't know what. Oh, how that's configured that two percent, and that's why I don't work for Opta. No, I have any interest in working for Opta, but the the what to kind of quantify it, but yeah, because it's now it's now even though you look at West Brom and their and their kind of recent results, it's it's four teams trying to get into one position, isn't it? It's, the playoff race isn't wide open. There's one gap, really, really. Yeah. I mean, I know the gap between West Brom in fifth and Norwich in sixth as as as. Um, gone as uh, narrowed somewhat, but they look pretty, pretty sh- like shoehorned in there, don't they? West, West Brom don't lose, they don't win many, no. but they but, don't. But, but, West Brom are, they, are, are shoe ins, yeah. And they've they, they got their work done early this season, haven't they? They got ahead of where they needed to get to, and then so you, you are afforded to drop a point here and there. Whereas with City, kind of flirting with the top six and and, and showing flashes of brilliance, um. But not the consistency, because because that's what we're talking about. You look at Ipswich on Saturday against against Norwich weren't at the best, and you've got to say the last few games they haven't been at the best. The, to win the game against Southampton uh, in the last dying seconds with a wonderful bit of improvisation and um, from Samiento after the the game turning on its head with a very dominant display in the middle portion of that from Southampton, but then a red card and and again the fine margins of our championship um, game is turned on its head was 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 there for us as all to see. But again, their consistent level of work has got them to where they needed to get to. People were talking about Leicester imploding. Leicester are top of the league. <laughs> oh, have the wheels come off? Well, not really. They win a couple of games. Someone else loses. Bang, back to the top. Leeds United lost for the first time this year uh, against the Coventry team that are buoyed by wonderful success so far in the FA Cup. Um, and and so we can work your way down. Southampton have been in fits and starts of that wonderful unbeaten record where they were looking realistically for a top two finish, have a bit of a wobble, but they've done that much good consistent work so far that they are still very much kind of shoe-ins for, for the top six, which then goes back to where City find themselves fighting out with Coventry, Borough and Preston to potentially finish in that last spot with Norwich in it as well. With that six-point cushion, yeah, there are games in hand around the teams um, uh, vying for those positions. I, I think they've got... a they've got a decent chance by virtue of the fact of 
games left and points left to win. But absolutely, and it's not not daft to say that a team in ninth is not in pole position for sixth spot. They're not. Norwich City, that's theirs to lose. Benzie? Aeroplane Jacko uh, contacts the uh, 1904 club uh, on Twitter, says, we need to win the lot, effectively seven points off with the goal difference. I think we'll fall just short with having Borough, Coventry and Ipswich to play, but I think generally he's enjoyed the season. Phil Rudderworth says it's, uh, Rudderworth says it's been a good step forwards in any case this uh, season. And uh, Craig Bell says, do you think we'll sell Philogene and given Adjun said recently he wouldn't sell for 30 million uh, euros, how big an offer would the club take? Uh, I think it's it's not unreasonable to think that come the summer, presuming that they don't get in the top, they don't win promotion, that somebody's going to have to go. You touched on it earlier on, you know, Adjun's funding the club to, a, you know, £400,000 a week to keep it going. Um, you know, the championship is, is an expensive league. They will want to reinvest some money uh, in the summer. So if somebody comes in with big money for Jaden, I don't think it's, and I, I don't see that as a negative either. We shouldn't. I don't think we should shy away from having the conversation or, or be frightened about it. It is a fact of being a club in the championship. There's Premier League clubs that we're seeing now are having to sell their the family silver, so to speak, to, to, to comply with the nonsensical PSR rules. So City are no different in the championship. You know they don't they don't get huge crowds. Ticket prices, we'll come on to that shortly um, regards to next season's prices. They don't charge a lot comparatively for ticket prices. Commercially, they're getting better. Things are improving, but they, they start at a really low base. So their income is, is quite low. If you look at their income streams compared to other championship clubs, it's still, it's still quite small. So that gap has to be bridged. If you're going to pay £5 million for Jaden Philogene, you know, that a lot of that money is going to have to come from the owner. It can't all come from cash reserves made by the football club. So I think it's I think it's you know it's, it's reasonable to expect that he might have to go. Greaves is another one who's been exceptional again. I thought he was brilliant to Cardiff. Uh, big miss over Easter. Uh, you know, if, if a big offer comes in for Jacob, I think they'll have to listen to it. I just think it's basic economics of a, of a championship club that doesn't make a huge amount of money, like City don't, that they're going to have to um, cut their cloth accordingly. And they've got, but what they have got is big saleable assets in, in Jacob and in Jaden. Now, I know Ashun said he wouldn't accept 30 million euros. Uh, it depends what, you know, the, the ball's in City's court in that sense that he's on he's on a long-term contract. He's a valuable asset. He now plays for England under 21s. He scored goals in the championship assists. Uh, he, he's, he's, a, he's a commodity, isn't he? A valuable one at that. It depends what somebody's willing to pay. And we know, particularly as the window gets you know, gets comes towards ending. Teams become a bit desperate. Uh, it could sometimes be that domino effect. I don't know. It's, it'll be interesting one to see whether City look to get, if they have to, do they get shot of him early in the window in, in the summer so they know where they are and they know what they can invest or do they leave it right up until the last minute, which can have an impact on the players they want to sign, but equally they might get a bigger price. It's so many, so many, you know, fascinating facets to that whole, that whole situation. But I guess we'll have to wait and see, won't we? Let's hope he puts another five or ten million on his value in the last six games because it, it looked on Saturday that he might be coming back to form a bit. Can I throw this one in? Uh, my mate Andrew sent me a text. I know we're going to talk about season ticket prices. Uh, he says a podcast talking point that might be worth airing. I keep hearing more and more season ticket uh, and Premier Club members disgruntled with all the cheap and half price tickets that are regularly offered to fill the stadium. Loyalty isn't being rewarded, but being out of pocket significantly. And with a price rise of 10 to 15 percent next season, and the many poor performances at home, I know people that will wait for the offers and not renew. Praise for lifting income for the club, but loyalty needs rewarding. Has anybody got a view on that? Pros, you were you were talking Pros, about Darren Anthony before, weren't you? Say again, Baz. You were we were talking off air about the ticket situation and how <laughs> yeah. I was actually praising the club for for. You know, have, we knew they had to raise it. I think the feeling was Tan had said before that they they felt that they might have to raise some prices by f as much as fifteen percent just to get mm. competitive. We know that when Ajun bought the club, he reduced so many tickets. Kids were letting for almost nothing. Uh, they they worked really hard to on on a competitive pricing policy, but ultimately, you know, they need to make you know everything's going up. We know mm. that, but clubs need to make money from somewhere. Yeah, yeah, they do, and that's I mean that. 
then kind of really does nicely dovetail into the that Philogene chat. If someone offers 30 million quid for Philogene, you sell him. That, that, it would be madness Great. not to sell him for 30 million quid. For 20 million quid, you sell him. That's that's just football finance. That's it's common sense. It's absolute fiscal common sense for City to do that. The the, the, the point that your mate makes, Bernsey, about um, the loyalty side of it is, is absolutely right. Is absolutely right. The, the, the ones that kind of, um, whether head or heart rules it, goes, I've seen this this season, I'm going to renew. They're, they're, they're the absolute lifeblood of what any football club is. Absolutely. They're, they are there thick and thin. They are there the good times and the bad times and the lean times and th- when things are a bit flush. That's not to say that people that decide on the day to go, their love for Hull City is 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 any less worthy. That's that's not the case I'm making. But the projection of knowing that hopefully we've boxed off this amount of people for this amount of games at the MKM over the course of a season, that's what football is. It's the belief that things are always going to be better. And I said before we start recording, it, it's the, the, the fact that we're sat here being able to record a podcast, the fact that I can work in a job in an industry covering games um, where... You, you buy a ticket for your favourite band. You buy a ticket because your favourite actor's in a film. You 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 go to the theatre because you love a certain musical, whatever it's because you know you're going to get entertained. Football as an industry, if you explained it to someone that didn't like football, you, they, they go, you could you can go to this place on Saturday for a couple of hours, and you might come off, you might come away from it so annoyed that you it's ruined your whole weekend. By the way. You've got to pay for that privilege. You you get carted off. I'm sorry. This is a pastime in England. And next yeah. week you're going to pay again next week to go again. And on Tuesday you might go 200 miles away to do the same thing, and um, it may still turn out the same way. But you invest in it for that time when you get the winners, the last minute winners. You get those games that you'll remember for 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 the rest of your life. And that's that's the that's the that's the the compromise that's made by a fan, isn't it? And that's sometimes I think is what clubs take advantage of. I'm not saying City do, because they always what what came out of COVID. Football's nothing without the fans. Correct. Then why is everyone's prices creeping up? It's creeping up because everything else is creeping up. Stop for a coffee on the way home at Costa, the drive-through, five pound twenty for for the for a coffee. You know, someone gives you. Oh, it's just that, and you kind of go. Well, you can't just be five pounds. You, you at least say it with a hint of self awareness to know this sounds like I'm taking the piss of it. That it's over a fiver for this cup of coffee that you've bought. But we just go, yeah, cheers, and you drive off, and then you go, Christ, is that where we are now? You, home insurance comes through, car insurance comes through. Why is it twice as much? Just because things cost more. Well, well, is that the answer now to everything? Just because it costs more because of inflation, because of things beyond our control. I'm not saying we live in the Matrix gang, but let's all dial in. We've got no chance of changing any of this. You've either got to get on board or completely unplug and go and live somewhere else because that's just the world that we're living in now. But that sense of football is creeping up. Running a stadium costs more. Staffing a stadium costs more. Looking after the pitch costs. Everything costs more. Everything is costing more. So at some stage, prices incrementally have to follow that. Darrow McAntony was talking, the Peterborough owner, about they've frozen prices at, at Posh. But they are going to have to go up. He's a businessman. Ajahn's a businessman. He's not giving tickets away for the next 10 years at Hull City, is he? I think he's done so many wonderful PR things, but the realistic businessman side of him, and the reason he is a very successful businessman, is you've got to make hard-headed decisions. And price increase, I'm not saying this flippantly, because it's money. It's cost people money to go and watch the championship. Too much money in certain sectors, I believe. But that's that's just what, what it is. Things are getting more expensive. Things are getting more... Um, incrementally more of a responsibility and, and, and a burden. It, it, it sounds callous to say, if you don't like it, don't go, because I understand what football clubs to mean, mean to people. These are people's lives, and you can't price the people out of it that were there when Hull City were terrible in League Two and nearly falling out the out the, out the pyramid. Burnsley, just one sec before you uh, you, you make yeah, your It's point. all right. It was, no, don't worry about it. I want you to just... What I would say about the city's membership scheme as well, I know it's, I know it's been much discussed over the years since the Alams brought it in. Um, what I like about their membership scheme is, admittedly, it's over twelve months, which is for, for some people will be will be easier. But they throw in so many other things, like you get you can you know rack up points to to exchange for merchandise. You know, shirts are expensive. Shirts are 
you know, that's another a topic for another week. But the, the, the cost of shirts across football is now a scandalous, you know, we saw with the England situation. Um, yeah. But you can exchange points for a home shirt, away shirt, whatever. You know, they did the, the holiday to Turkey a couple of weeks ago was exclusive for members. They're doing a, they've done it before. They're doing it again in a couple of weeks. You know, you can go to, um, you, you can go and bowl with some of the first team players and you get free bowling, you get free food and you bowl with, with Fabio Carvalho. I mean, you know, they did, they for the kids, they do FIFA nights where you can go and play FIFA with the play, the first team players. We're not talking under 16s where that's, you know, with respect, it's easy to set up something and get the under 16s to go and do it. We're talking with, you know, the, the, these top, top first team players. So there's a lot of, I think with City, there's a lot of added extras that you get for being a member that it isn't just, you know, I think of, I think of the club I've supported for 30 odd years and had season tickets out for 25 years. All I ever got was a season. I just, I got, I paid 500 quid a year. I got, I, I got a, a guaranteed seat for 23 championship games. I had to pay extra for cup tickets. Um, I, I, there was a, for a period of time, you got a 10% discount in the shop, but they soon got rid of that. So literally for 500 quid a year, I got a match ticket. Well, at City for, 350 quid a year you get a match ticket but you get the opportunity to go to a host of events you get the chance to go on holiday you get you know you, you can clock up your points to get discount on tickets or discount on your know, replica kit and all that sort of thing so i think you know i think they go a, 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 i'm not trying to be their pr person here but i'm just trying to put some an well, facts. Them, that's actually. not pr but you know, that's not that's not pr that they're facts. reasonable point. they're facts Go on, Ben. What were you going to say, Ben? Because I know we have. No, it's, 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 no, it's, it's. They're all reasonable points, but um, I thought it would. I, I, I would raise it in in the, the the way the ticket prices have gone up. They're still competitively priced. They, they still mm. look good value. Yeah. Um, and I, I think the fan base has taken it. You know, they they, they accept um, that they might have to pay a little bit more. I think it was the the, the feeling that those. Uh, and those that are being most loyal that are members, like you say, you get all those chances. So, um, Andrew, thank you very much uh, for raising it. Where are we going next? We've not got a great deal. And I'm conscious uh, Fletch is... Fletch is looking as though... I, I noticed Cluedo 2 is coming to the whole new theatre. And uh, Fletch looks so he might be playing Colonel Mustard, the room he's in today. He's in Colonel Mustard's dressing room. What's going on there, <laughs> Fletch? We've got two, anyway. two, two quick subjects because I, I I know we're pushed for time and I've got a race to the training ground to interview the manager. Um, Fletch, Dilap's back. That's that's a big, big, uh, I don't know what I was going to say there, a big boost for everybody, not least for the player himself. I mean, Sorry. it helps if you unmute your microphone. Well, I'm just, you know, I'm trying to mute my mic to stop swearing at the fact that, you know, Burns is talking complete mustard because I've just Googled who Colonel Mustard is. <laughs> <laughs> but um, <laughs> Delap, yeah, honestly, I've never been so excited from a striker for a very long time when it comes to Hull City. And we've shared, I think, that um, th that thought as well. It's just, we all just hope that he hits the ground running straight away because, as we've alluded to, there's not many games left. He can do it because he scored on debut away at Norwich. Um, and fair play to Manchester City, giving the Tigers the green light to say, right, he's ready to go now. Liam's alluded to the fact it won't be a full 90 minutes on Wednesday. We'll probably, Baz, you'll obviously get an update later today. But... I don't think the feeling, the, certainly, I'm, obviously, we're coming to you ahead of speaking to Liam this afternoon um, after Dilap's first training session. The feeling is that he won't be involved on Wednesday um, because he's obviously been out for three months and away from the group. Um, I'm, there's got to be a temptation from from Liam Rossini to chuck him on the bench, but mm. he will certainly be on the bench on Saturday for the visit of QPR. Well, that's good. That's really good because. It, but the other thing as well is he's such a bubbly, nice character as well. And these are things that people don't see day to day. You look at what sort of characteristics he's got, the connections he's got, the relationships he's got with the team, and as as someone who knows exactly what he wants from his footballing output, he. That helps settle people. So if, mm. if they know his key, key responsibilities are obviously to score goals and they'll know from what he's done so far this season, in the first half of the season, what he was able to do, terrorise defenders, putting them on the backsides and finishing in powerful ways. So, yeah, very happy. Prots, um did that back then in the squad on we expect on Saturday, mm. of the lone players, who drops out? Because they can only name five in a matchday squad. Uh, they've obviously got 
five uh, and Dilaps the six. They've got Zorori Giles. Um, you know, there's uh, Ohio. There's, they've got a, Carvalho. There's a lot of players they've got. Who drops out? Well, Giles be fit. That's that's the question, isn't it? We'll have to wait and see. I mean, it, it feels like uh, Wednesday night will come too soon, but I would imagine he'll be back for Saturday. That's the hope, anyway. Would be Ohio, wouldn't it? What? You'd think so, wouldn't you? Well, I mean, because he's not done anything. Burnsy? I hadn't really thought about it, I didn't, and which is why I asked about Giles' fitness. Um, yeah, maybe Ohio, maybe Zorori's not quite done it. Don't know. I mean, the, the, yeah, what, what it's, you'd... it's a problem to have. So you'd, yeah, you'd oh, that's a great problem to have. I mean, what what you kind of look at is with Zorori, he offers more in a wider position than Liam would do, wouldn't he? Whereas Ohio is a bit more like not like for like like positionally. I'm saying what, what the best you've seen of Liam is down the middle with the ability to play slightly wider. But um, I think swapping him for, for Noah is, is pretty straightforward. Uh, um, Jury's still out on, on Ohio, which is which is fine. That's that's not to kind of... That's not being condescending. It's, it's just he's not either had the opportunity, has he? I mean, minutes on the pitch is how you really show people what you can do. Whereas Liam, there's, the, Liam's got a bank of work earlier on this season that City fans are thinking, well, obviously, if he's fit, then he comes in to do that. And I think Liam Rossini, the manager, of course, might be thinking the same way. Um, the, the expectation levels will be very high on what Liam brings back to the side. But quite rightly so, because look, look, look at what's at stake, potentially a top six finish. So I'm hoping that he comes back in with, with that proper bit between his teeth. The frustration, having been there myself, the frustration of watching a team ebb and flow when you are nowhere near affecting that is is very keenly felt by any footballer worth his salt. So I sincerely hope it's a case of unleash him and let him terrorise what he's got for these last uh, uh, half dozen games. Just finally, because like I said before, we are pushed. Um, I, the final thing I wanted to bring up on the podcast today was um, uh, the subject of racism. And, and Liam was Liam Rossini was, was subjected to um, some abuse after the nomination for manager of the year, which, by the way, all credit to him and his staff for getting that nomination shows how far the football club have come as a whole in the last 12 months. Um, but naturally, with, with, with that, um, there was some rather, rather distasteful, abhorrent stuff that was said. City have reported it to the police um, and Humberside Police were investigating. I thought Liam spoke exceptionally candidly with, with, with Mike from the BBC about it. And then at, at Cardiff on Saturday, uh, there was a fan that had got a say no to racism sign um, in the crowd, in the city crowd, the, the away fans. And Liam held that up um, 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 to a huge applause from the, the 900 or so that had made the journey to South Wales. Just wanted to say, really, that um, what what class the manager spoke with and, and how you know, how dignified he was, given the fact that he said it was, you know, he was referred to as a monkey, which is just incredible in this day and age, any day and age. But, you know, water off a duck's back, he said, but it affected his children because they saw it and and what have you. And that is, it's deplorable, isn't it? And, and you know, we've got to do something about it. Social media sites have got to do more. We keep saying it, nothing, nothing ever seems to happen, but... Well, never, got, but will that change? I mean, no, I, 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 know, I know Liam, love him to bits, um, spent a lot of time in my professional career working with people of all creeds and colours and, and religions and races, and I, ironic that you say that, I was in a, a, a company down just outside of London where Liam's dad, Leroy, was running a, a, a seminar on uh, diversity and inclusion and... and um, overt and subconscious bias, uh, racism in the workplace. He's got an MBE, his dad, for, for that type of service to many industries and, and absolutely thoroughly well-deserved and has experienced abhorrence, as you say, over the course of being over here. I speak to Joby McInniff a lot. His dad was part of the Windrush generation. Um, and what they've, what he's seen his dad firsthand um, face and experience. And all normal people know that this is wrong, know that this is rubbish, know that it's got no place anywhere. The thing that kills it is this thing that's got a portal to the darkest depths of the human subconscious and it, 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 it's an open door of just spewing vomit, whether it's 
saying stuff like that, whether it's going out of your way to pile on people to say that I don't like a commentator because they do this. You've got an opinion on this, so that means that. It's just, it's just, it's not a, it's not a delightful dinner party where everyone's swapping opinions. It's a, it's a, it's a vacuum of screaming at each other, which is just utter rubbish. I'd like to think Liam knows how much he's loved and respected and, and liked. Uh, whether that makes any difference for some mindless idiot being able to climb inside your brain with a tweet and say, "I think you're this because of your skin color." I don't know because I can't. I've, not got that lived experience being a, a middle class white man from the north of England. I absolutely hold my hands up for that. But like I said, the people that do end up on the receiving end of this, it's important to know that we all value exactly what they are, who they are, and what they are, and know that they've got our backing. Whether that makes it any better, whether that's any consolation whatsoever, I don't know. But this you say about this day and age, Baz. Sorry, I've I've the nasty feeling that kind of unsettles us all as human beings is, I don't think that stuff will ever change. Bernsey? I think there's, on a future podcast, we can talk more about this because Prot's raised some really good points and I think we ought to talk about social media uh, and, and how it affects people and everything like that. I just hope with, with this particular moron, and there are quite a few morons out there, that the, 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 it's good that the police are involved. It's good that the club have got the police involved that the full force of the law comes to bear if they can track them down through social media and at least an example has been is is made it's not the sort of stuff you can you can get away with and the social media companies need to do more as well but hopefully part of me you know don't give them the oxygen of publicity but you've you've got to sort of knock it on the head you've, it, people have to be made an example mm. of it, 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 it's it's the thing that the, the the bit that underpins it all, and not that we're trying to finish the podcast on a, on a real low point, and um, without using expletives, you just read stuff like that, and you just wish, and it's very naive. But people like that would just disappear. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. it, the human yeah. existence is 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 ridiculous enough without people having to put up with that utter well, rubbish. Well, perhaps after all this happened, I had a look through the people who follow me on my social media account, and I found somebody who's not based in the UK, who's quite openly in this person's bio, is, um, well, for, no, he's racist. Mm. No, you can't sugarcoat it. The person no. is racist and is openly racist in their bio. And after I'd reported it, you know, blocked the individual, this, that and the other, I just sat back and it made me think, what rabbit holes have you gone down to, th yeah. to think to, to what what bilge have you been consuming? What's been you know in your life which has mm. made you think this way? So my message is, if if you do have you know, if you are racist, stay as far away from this football club as possible because we don't want you. Yeah. Pertinent point to end on, um, and best wishes to Liam and his family. I know. Um, He's, 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 we don't always agree and that's the beauty of football but um, he's been a pleasure to deal with Liam and the club have been have dealt with this really really well um, so that's it from this episode of the 1904 Club just to let you know we are planning another live event so stay tuned for de ticket details I'm struggling to get my words out details on that coming up very very soon we will have a ticket special ticket detail event. yeah all right, Louis Coyle. Um, we'll have a, a special bonus episode coming on Thursday after the game against Middlesbrough and um, looking back on that and also looking ahead to QPR. Uh, and that's it, everybody. As always, keep getting in touch. Thank you very much for, for watching, for listening. Prots, thank you for your time as always, mate. My pleasure. My pleasure. We've touched on some really good things there and some really important things. Football is a wonderful game for us all and keep the dickheads out. Absolutely. Just quickly, promote your cycling podcast with Jeremy Vine. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there's a certain ex-Manchester City player midfielder that'll be well into that, I tell you. Oh, God. But yeah, quickly, your podcast that you that you were delayed for this morning, What? where, where, it, can, we, where can we get not, it? It's not a cycling podcast, it's a motor <laughs> cycling <laughs> podcast. How many times, and I know you're doing it on purpose now, just to wind me up, next thing you'll be saying it's about mopeds. Mopeds at motorbikes. <laughs> it's me and you and Thomas, former Olymp uh, Olympic athlete, chatting to the great and the good about um, the passion for two wheels with a motor on it, i.e. a motorbike. Uh, it's coming, coming later in April, so there you go. Lovely. Fletch, thanks for your time. As always, thank you. Burnsy, keep up the good work. Here's everybody. Cheers. See you later.